Second of the one-two punch to the White House today on the push to reform voting rights. It's essentially dead now. The two bills Democrats have said are needed to rescue democracy will not make it into law unless something extraordinary and, frankly, unforeseen happens. Senator Kirsten Sinema delivered the final blow. The Democrat from Arizona gave an impassioned speech from the Senate floor. She said she will not be in favor of changing the filibuster rules in order to pass voting rights. These bills help treat the symptoms of the disease, but they do not fully address the disease itself. And while I continue to support these bills, I will not support separate actions that worsen the underlying disease of division infecting our country. And there you go. Without her with, and without Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, the Democrats do not have a way to break through a Republican blockade. They've called the reforms unnecessary, federal overreach that would infringe on the ability of states to conduct their own elections and set their own rules. Democrats have argued otherwise, saying national election standards are essential to ensure people's right to vote. According to the Brennan Center, last year, at least 19 states passed 34 laws that restrict access to voting. More than 440 bills with provisions that restrict voting access were introduced in 49 states. Senator Sinema's speech delivered in just a few hours before the president arrived on the Hill to meet with Senate Democrats for the sole purpose of trying to get everybody on board. Afterwards, the president said he'd continue to fight if he's unable to meet this moment. I hope we can get this done, but I'm not sure. Like every other major civil rights bill that came along, if we missed the first time, we could come back and try it a second time. We missed this time. And the state legislative bodies continue to change the law, not as to who can vote, but who gets to count the vote. Count the vote. Count the vote. It's about election subversion. Well, this would be the second major legislative defeat for the president after he failed to get his social spending plan through. And this one on voting rights would also break a promise he made to the black voters who delivered him the presidency. A.B. Stoddard now, associate editor and columnist for Real Clear Politics. A.B., as always, thanks. Would, would this be a, a legacy-defining failure for the president, given the stakes presented, or would that be an overreach? Well, I think that when the president uh, announced, when the White House announced over um, in December, when the breakdown happened in negotiations for his economic agenda, his social spending package, the Build Back Better plan, and they put voting rights first and said they had to deal with it first, and they would put uh, their domestic agenda on the back burner for now. He did make it uh, a key priority, promising the base of the Democratic Party uh, that they would come up with some way to address this. We're now in an election year. They don't have the votes to proceed, and it is the kind of failure that will be dispiriting to the base of the Democratic Party. It will hurt them at the polls in the fall. Uh, this is why you saw a lot of uh, voting rights sure. activists sit out the speech he gave in Georgia several sure. days ago, because they want a result, and the math will not produce one in the Senate, and um, it's going to be very tough for Biden to come up with the next plan. So many saying if he wanted it so bad, why didn't he do it first? At any rate, Senators Manchin and Sinema have gotten the brunt of the criticism here, obviously, but... Senator Sinema's argument for not changing the rules was this. Eliminating the 60 vote threshold on a party line with the thinnest of possible majorities to pass these bills that I support will not guarantee that we prevent demagogues from winning office. Rather, eliminating the 60 vote threshold will simply guarantee that we lose a critical tool that we need to safeguard our democracy from threats in the years to come. A.B., that point, it's valid, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And this is the point that Senator Obama and Senator Biden, when they served in the upper chamber, would make when, they, when their party was in the minority. There is tons of sound of people on both sides of the aisle when they are in the minority in the chamber fighting for this, the filibuster as a means to protect the minority, to slow down the passions of the electorate and the body politic, and to create a sense of, to force consensus that any legislation 
uh, that passes through the chamber to a president's desk to be signed into law would have to, to be bipartisan, would have to get 60 votes. And it's and in this polarized environment, it's very hard for either party to ever have 60 votes in the chamber. And so this is, um, this is absolutely the argument for preserving the filibuster. And when President Trump tried repeatedly to pressure Mitch McConnell, now the Senate Minority Leader, to break the filibuster, he refused because he didn't want the shoe to be on the other foot. Many Democrats, like President Biden, fear what Republicans would do without a legislative filibuster. But President Biden this year ended up changing his mind. A.B. Stoddard, thank you.